Was ist das? Sorry, no, you don't need to, Chris, uh, unless you wish. Hi, everyone. I'm Vasan Srinivasan, chairperson of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. It's a privilege to lead this wonderful community-based mental health. Health organization in its 91st year of establishment. The MHFA has grown strength to strength over the past few years. With Victorian Mental Health Month in 2018, the National Mental Health Month occurring in 2019, 2020, and this year in 2021. Last year, COVID 19 did not stop us from achieving our National Mental Health Month campaign. I'm proud to say we successfully shifted many events to a virtual platform, very much being able to pursue our objectives of raising awareness and advocating for better Australian mental health. Our primary aim is to reach out to and educate as many Australians as possible, to help reduce stigma and to encourage constructive and non-judgmental dialogue on Australia's critical mental health issue. The highlight of last year's campaign was reaching out to 100,000 Australians all across the country for our national walks for mental health, both virtually through our MHFA app and physically in some states. What a grand success that was. In 2021, with pandemic still affecting many of us, we decided not to give up once again, curating a carefully chosen blend of virtual and physical events for Australians to participate in. This year, we have a new and improved MHFA app, giving people the opportunity to participate in National Mental Health Month from the palms of their hands. This year, theme is mental health and post-pandemic recovery challenges and resilience. Mental Health Foundation Australia is proud to partner with Australian technology business, DB Results, and take up the wellbeing app, Am I OK? to support our members, enabling individuals to regularly check in on a private and secure platform and ask the question, Am I OK? Am I OK also alerts the user when it's time to seek outside help. We thank DB Results for this opportunity to promote well-being and early intervention. This year, we have launched a special initiative, the Mental Health Appeal on the 10th of October, our World Mental Health Day. Through this, we aim to raise funds for the development of a course promoting life and safety in young people. At the MHFA, we pride ourselves in making sure all of our programs are for the community and powered by the community. We have a vast growing network of multicultural ambassadors, youth ambassadors and future leaders who further the community voice in promoting mental health and well-being. Our multicultural network has inspired our educational and multicultural webinars as an initiative to assist individuals cope with success during the pandemic. I would like to take this moment to thank our board directors and patrons, scientific advisory committee members our wonderful staff, multicultural and youth ambassadors, future leaders, MHFA members and major sponsors for their continuous support to our organization. As we continue to work to deepen understanding of the importance of mental well-being and educating the community, let's work in solidarity for the benefit of our mental health. Thank you, Australia. Hi, everyone. I'm Vasan Srinivasan. Over 400 young people lose their lives to suicide each year. This number is 400 too many. This year, the MHFA is launching the Mental Health Appeal on the 10th of October, raising funds to develop an evidence-based training program primarily aimed at promoting life and safety in young people. Join us this October in the fight against suicide. Your dollars and cents will help us prevent. Visit our website for more information on how you can support this course. We're counting on you, Australia. Welcome uh, to the Mental Health Foundation Australia 
World Mental Health Day Summit. Uh, I'm Bruce Tong. I'm very grateful to be one of the patrons of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. I'm an academic and uh, clinical child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, a previous director of the Centre for Developmental Psychiatry and Psychology at Monash University. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to this uh, very important uh, day. This year, the Foundation uh, Mental Health Month focuses on promoting mental health and building resilience in the face of stress and the challenges of the pandemic. We acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and all their communities. I welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, who might be joining us today. We recognise that you have faced long-standing challenges to your mental health and well-being through the experience of dispossession, marginalisation, forced family disruption and genocide, and even today have proportionally much lower rates of COVID vaccination than the general population. I particularly welcome and pay my respects to my colleague, uh, Paliku woman, Professor Helen Milroy from Western Australia, who will be addressing us on the issue of family mental health. The Mental Health Foundation Australia is the oldest not-for-profit community mental health organisation advocating for better mental health for all in Australia since 1930. The Foundation has been working in this community for over 90 years promoting mental health, especially in multicultural communities through our extensive network of multicultural community leaders. This year, our Mental Health Month month program is open online to all and includes celebration with song, dance, artwork, creative writing and exercise, particularly our national Walk for Mental Health Month on the 17th of October. Our symposia, forums, expo and this summit covers topics across the age spectrum and focuses on specific challenges that many people from all works of life face, including Indigenous, multicultural, refugee and gender diverse communities, also including families and youth. The sessions originate from all Australian states and territories. Today, this World Mental Health Day Summit has significant contributions from international experts, mental health policy makers and those with the lived experience of mental health challenges. We will cover topics relating to the impact of the pandemic on mental health from social and cultural perspectives relating to women, the family, education, the community and workplace and uh, globally. Today, the foundation also launches the Mental Health Appeal. Please donate. Information can be found on the foundation's website, mhfa.org.au. I thank all of the Mental Health Foundation Australia volunteers and staff led by Aisha Usman, our manager, who have worked so hard to organise this summit and all the Mental Health Month activities. I particularly acknowledge the tireless work and vision of the foundation chairperson, Mr. Vasan Srinivasan, who has ensured the success of this enterprise. I now introduce Vasan, who will provide the welcome address. Good morning, and thank you, everyone. And thank you to Professor Bruce Tong. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation Australia, I welcome you all, one of our key events during National Mental Health Month Awareness Campaign 2021, our, our World Mental Health Day Summit. I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we gather this morning. I would like to pay my respects to the elder, past, present, and emerging, and I extend this same respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here with us this morning. It gives me great pressure to be addressing you at this event on a World Mental Health Day. This event for Mental Health Foundation Australia 
is a first of its kind. Although we would have enjoyed having this event in person, we are glad for it to be going ahead on this virtual platform, where I'm sure it will reach many more individuals. Throughout the day, we will have opportunity to hear from distinguished researchers and leading international and leading international mental health professionals and experts on various important topics. Carefully planned by our summit chair, Emirate Professor, Emeritus Professor Bruce Tong. I would like to especially thank Professor Bruce Tong, who has provided much guidance in putting together today's summit. I would like to acknowledge and thank all speakers who have graciously accepted our invitation to present today. I extend this acknowledgement to all section chairs, many of whom belong to MHFA board and scientific advisory committee, who have thoughtfully invited our speakers relevant to each topic. I would also like to mention that alongside this event, we are also running our mental health appeal today. This is a milestone event for MHFA. Beginning this year, on the 10th of October, we hope to make this capstone event for each year to come. This year, we are raising funds to develop an evidence-based training program specific to positive and strength-based youth mental health and well-being promotion and suicide prevention primarily aimed at promoting life and safety in young people. As I speak now, many of our multicultural ambassadors have volunteered their time to answer our appeal line, 1-800-642-773. Where we hope individuals across the country and even across the world will call to donate their dollars and cents to help us prevent. I once again welcome you all to today's summit. I'm sure you will all enjoy each speaker sharing their valuable insights. Now I would like to invite Mr. Kevin McCoy, CEO of Independent Assisted Living at Australian Unity to say a few words. As Mental Health Foundations Australia's major sponsor for National Mental Health Awareness yeah. Campaign 2021. Thank you all. Good morning. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands upon which we meet today. For me personally, I'm on the land of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also would like to thank all attendees of this summit who have joined us today for World Mental Health Day. Your presence demonstrates your commitment to mental health and I appreciate you being with us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin McCoy. I'm the CEO for Independent and Assisted Living here at Australian Unity. For 180 years, we've been delivering products and services that contribute to the real well-being of our members, employees and the broader Australian community. We've supported Australians through times of war, financial upheaval and natural disaster as well as in the recovery and rebuilding efforts that followed those shattering events. Today, we face a once in a lifetime pandemic and our approach remains the same. Like Australian Unity, the Mental Health Foundation has a long history of working to improve the well-being of the community. This is the third year we've worked together for mental health. Across the month of October, a range of events have been organized to foster community resilience as we navigate our way out of the pandemic. Australian Unity is proud to support this great work and is encouraging everybody to get involved. Good mental health is vital to our well-being, and at Australian Unity, well-being is at the heart of everything we do. 20 years ago, we conceptualized the idea of a national index of well-being that could be used to track social progress in Australia. <clears throat> the Australian Unity Wellbeing Index has been influential in shaping policy and providing guidance for governments and other organizations on how they can contribute 
to improving individual and community well-being. Two decades of research shows us the secret of happiness boils down to three things we call the golden triangle of happiness. Good personal relationships, financial security, and a sense of purpose in life. Our Remedy Healthcare business has provided its MindStep program to more than 2,500 folk. Built around low intensity cognitive behavioral therapy, MindStep is a six week phone and internet based program that empowers participants to manage their mental health on their terms in the privacy of their own home. More than 60% of MindStep participants recovered within three months, compared to a benchmark self recovery rate over three months of 23% for untreated patients. Earlier this year, Remedy Healthcare, in conjunction with Australian Unity's Indigenous Services, launched a culturally sensitive adaptation of the MindStep Mental Health Program called Healing Minds. The coaching is tailored for Aboriginal people, developed by Aboriginal people and delivered by Aboriginal coaches. Plans are underway to adapt the Healing Minds Program for Australians from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. This year, Remedy Healthcare also announced new mental health partnerships with Tasmania and Healthy North Coast Primary Health Networks to deliver early interventions for people at risk of mild mental illness. These government funded services will support people with anxiety and depression, people experiencing isolation, those in rural and remote locations, and people affected by pandemic related isolation and bushfires. Mental Health Month is an important opportunity to raise awareness about the impacts of mental health and the range of supports available that can improve our sense of well-being. Australian Unity is a company founded on social values and community contribution, and we are committed to building and promoting positive mental health strategies. We will continue to identify and help solve the health, care and well-being needs of the broader community. Thank you and have a wonderful day. For, and for Australian Unity's ongoing support. I would now like to invite Daniela Piacopa, the General Manager of Marketing at Chemisone, to say a few words as MHFA's major sponsor of National Mental Health Awareness Campaign 2021. Hi, my name is Daniela. I'm the Head of Marketing for Chemisone at Aratex Pharmaceuticals. Chemisone is an Australian-owned, trusted brand in community pharmacy for over 25 years. We're proud to be partnering with Mental Health Foundation to promote better mental health in local communities around Australia, particularly with our dedicated customers, our pharmacists, who are integral in providing support to their local communities every single day. This year's theme of post-pandemic recovery challenges and resilience will no doubt resonate with individuals, families and work teams, as we've all personally and collectively been impacted one way or another over the last 18 months. This extends to our customers on the front line who have been constantly under pressure to continue to serve their local communities during the pandemic with issues including stockpiling, medication shortages and continuously providing health advice and service to customers. If there is anything this pandemic has shown us, it is resilience of the community. However, what is crucial today is the promotion of non-judgmental discussion around the importance of mental health and the mission of this foundation to support these discussions and champion positive mental health is a matter Chemisone supports wholeheartedly. We thank Mental Health Foundation Australia for recognising the various vulnerable communities in Australia and dedicating events to professionals, including the discussion of mental health for pharmacists, acknowledging the vital role pharmacists play in our community's response to mental health issues and recognising the increasing vulnerability they face due to their profession. Lastly, through the annual Chemisone Help Us Help Our Local Community campaign, participating pharmacies will nationally come together to support this foundation with us and their local community through the sales of Chemisone until December. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, I'm Professor Pantelis. I'm uh, the neuropsychiatrist at uh, the University of Melbourne. 
Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here today to discuss a uh, very topic, important topic um, with um, the pandemic being something that's affected all of our lives over the last two years. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Tong for the kind invitation to, to, to invite the, uh, this uh, symposium and uh, to have um, some world experts present on this very important topic. At the beginning of the pandemic, we became really quite concerned about the impact of uh, the virus, not only in terms of uh, uh, what it was doing um, uh, to the respiratory system, but also that it might have an impact on the brain. And together with Associate Professor uh, Mahesh Jayaram, we started to uh, examine what was happening uh, with, the, uh, with the brain. We're going to start with Associate Professor uh, Mahesh Jayaram's talk as we've, we seem to have uh, had some difficulties getting our international speaker online. Um, Professor Jayaram is Director of Teaching and Learning at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne and is also a consultant psychiatrist uh, at Melbourne Health. He has particular interest and expertise in uh, schizophrenia. He's uh, a coordinating editor of the Cochrane Schizophrenia uh, Initiative. And he also uh, is involved in developing um, teaching programs throughout uh, the University of Melbourne in psychiatry. Today, he'll be talking about the impact on the brain of a COVID uh, infection and uh, looking at the neurological, neuropsychiatric, as well as some of the mental health issues uh, related particularly to long COVID, which will, is something that will impact those who develop the illness. Professor uh, Jayaram, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'll just share my slides. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, First of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, wherever we may be and meeting today. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers of Mental Health uh, Foundation Australia for inviting me to speak today. It's truly an honor and uh, privilege and I'm humbled to be here. What I hope to do today is to discuss some key neurological and psychiatric issues that can occur as a result of COVID-19 infection. Uh, the first half of my talk will, will focus on a paper that Chris Pantelis uh, and I and other colleagues uh, wrote in a team effort that involved uh, neurologists, psychiatrists, and basic uh, clinician scientists uh, when we were trying to understand what's happening uh, in terms of the impact on the brain from COVID infection, but also what we've learned in the past from other similar infections. What do we know from animal studies? And if this would inform uh, our thinking and shape uh, future management of COVID and its complications, which we are likely to see in the coming years. Um, and in the la la latter half of the talk, I'll focus on co long COVID, which is becoming increasingly an issue. And also this paper we published is about a year old now. And Scientific literature is being published at warp speed. There's papers coming out every day and it's hard to keep up with what's uh, happening, but I'll try and attempt to summarize um, and bring the literature up to date uh, in terms of the concepts as we know today. Back in January, February last year, Chris and I were, were sort of looking around the world, what's happening uh, with COVID spreading, uh, both from in China and across Europe. And we were uh, intrigued by the phenomena uh, called anosmia or agusia. Uh, th this uh, anosmia refers to a loss of sense of smell and agusia or dysgeusia refers to uh, loss of taste or dysregulation in taste. 
uh, and Chris being a neuropsychiatrist and myself being a psychiatrist, we were quite interested uh, and began to discuss whether there's actually a portal of entry for the virus to enter the brain from, from the nasal pathways, whether the olfactory nerve, that the nerve that carries sensations of smell from, from the nose to the base of the brain can be involved in, in this mechanism. And this is where we first started working in this area. And when we first uh, looked at some of the papers emerging at the time, uh, there's a few papers here, but I'll just focus on some important studies. The, the Lycan paper first reported uh, more than four 400 patients who were experiencing um, dysregulation in their sense of smell and taste and found that more than 80% of the patients were having problems with, with smell and, and taste. So this is a highly significant number. And uh, at the time, the American Association of Otolaryngology and the WHO were beginning to take note of this. And as many of you might remember, this became added uh, as a screening questionnaire to try and detect if somebody was experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, because these symptoms of loss of smell and taste began to occur just even prior to respiratory symptoms becoming manifest. And of course, we were interested to find out if we could do some tests and investigations uh, to find out if uh, we can detect changes that are occurring in the brain. And sure enough, an early paper uh, came out that, that it did indicate that this was uh, indeed possible, um, that some structures in the brain are getting infected and affected because of COVID-19 infection. Uh, what you see here, these two short uh, white arrows pointing towards is called the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb is a, is a sort of rounded structure at the base of the brain, which is essentially a mass of tissue that is central to processing uh, a sense of smell. And uh, what we found was that scans could show that these areas uh, were, were showing signs of hyperintensity on the scans, which, uh, which was uh, intriguing from a scientific perspective. And subsequent uh, scans began to show, this was another study of five COVID patients um, that showed that there was evidence of uh, micro bleeding in, in the same area of the olfactory bulb. So uh, micro bleeding was detected by uh, detecting a component called methemoglobin that's uh, present in the bloodstream. And what this indicated uh, to us uh, and the wider scientific community is that COVID-19 infection can cause direct damage to the brain, and evidence of this can be seen on MRI scans. Uh, and I'm just going to take you through the literature as it evolved uh, in real time at the time, because uh, we were trying to understand what is the mechanism of action of this injury happening. Uh, in terms of loss of smell, it became clear that there were two uh, uh, things going on. One was something called the ACE2 receptor mediated uh, injury. And we now know that this is fully established um, in that ACE2 is, uh, is a receptor that binds to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID-19 virus. And it's then transported along the, the, the nervous tissue, but also the supporting nervous tissue for the olfactory or the, the, the nerve that carries the sense of smell smell, this called the cystanticular cells were involved in this process. So this was a mechanism through which the, the virus was actually able to enter the, the central nervous system in the brain. In terms of loss of uh, taste, um, the, the, the oral epithelium or, the, or the, the mouth that contains the taste buds are constantly regenerated. Our taste buds have a lifespan of about 10 days and are constantly renewed from a population of uh, what we call as stem cells. However, if somebody has a COVID-19 infection, there's inflammatory markers that, that are released called cytokines and uh, tumor necrosis factors and so on. And these impede the stem cell proliferation of growth. And what that does is it stops the taste buds from being regenerated. And as a result, people experience loss of taste. But thankfully, most of the time, this is short-lived. And when people recover from the infection, the taste buds do regenerate and people regain their sense of smell and uh, taste. So <clears throat> well, this was just one feature. And, and we began to think, surely it's not just taste, uh, taste and smell that's being affected. Let's have a look at what's happening in the wider brain. And um, our, our colleagues from from Alfred and Monash University collaborated with us to review the literature at the time. And we found that people <clears throat> experiencing severe 
uh, COVID infection, we're also demonstrating uh, signs of damage in the brain. So, so those who experience high temperatures and agitation were experiencing cognitive um, dysfunction. They, they were struggling with their thinking <clears throat> and memory and so on. And uh, some tests we the people were conducting at the time, such as uh, analysis of the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the, the fluid in the spinal column, uh, was showing fragments of viral particles or evidence of infection. Although the direct viral particle was not isolated early on, there was significant evidence to suggest that there was infection going on in the brain and we could detect that. It, uh, over the next few months, again, more and more papers began to emerge documenting in detail the, the type of damage that was occurring in the brain. So, so there was evidence of inflammation in the brain called encephalitis. Uh, people were being treated with steroids, high dose steroids and so on. Um, many made recovery, but sadly uh, patients were losing their lives to it as well. Uh, there was increased incidence of strokes. Um, uh, more and more people were having two types of strokes, hemorrhagic strokes where there was bleeding or uh, thrombotic strokes due to clotting. Um, but also evidence of lung microhemorrhages were occurring. And you, you might um, uh, go back to the other slide I talked about microhemorrhages happening in the brain. This is the same sort of feature that's occurring in the lung. And now we know that these sort of microhemorrhages or microbleeding is happening in other organs as well. It happens in the kidneys, it happens in the heart and so on. And this is of crucial importance because a lot of people suffering with long COVID symptoms, excessive fatigue and muscle ache and so on, um, it's quite possible that these microhemorrhages are contributing to it. So, so there was increased risk of clotting, increased risk of strokes uh, that were causing significant um, damage to the brain. Uh, there's, there's, again, lots of studies here we reviewed, but I'll focus on two important studies. The Mao et al. paper that came out um, from about 200 patients who, who were affected found that uh, apart from stroke, which was increased uh, by about 6% of the patients, people also had impaired consciousness and muscle injury, uh, again, a feature that we, we continue to see today long after the infection, the acute infection has resolved. And this paper from France by Nathan uh, and colleagues looked at infants um, less than three months of age. Back in, back in April, uh, many of you might recall, access to testing for COVID-19 was not that easy. Uh, and in France, they had some pregnant mothers who, uh, who were showing clear signs of COVID-19 infection, but they weren't able to test them. But children born to them were showing neurological signs of hypotonia or being very flaccid in terms of their tone, excessive drowsiness and, and not being quite right uh, for children that age. So there was evidence emerging that, that young infants uh, were also being impacted by the disease in, in addition to adults. So, so we tried to understand what is the mechanism by which this virus causes injury. And uh, the consensus now has emerged that there are three possible pathways of uh, injury to the brain. One is uh, uh, directly mediated by the ACE2 receptor system. So this uh, binds to the virus and the virus enters the brain directly. It's a phenomenon called as neuroinvasion or direct damage to the brain. And ACE2 ACE receptors are present in various parts of the brain. So that's quite likely to occur. There's also uh, a mechanism of uh, infection called axonal transport. So once it enters the, the, the nervous tissue fibers, the axons that conduct electrical signals in the brain, and there's millions and billions of them. And um, what, what tends to happen is the virus uh, passes backwards in, in this axonal tissue, uh, we, we call retrograde spread. And the last mechanism is, uh, is something called the Trojan horse phenomena, wherein the white blood cells, these are the cells that fight infection in our brain, ingest the coronavirus particle. And then as a result of it, um, it damages the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a protective barrier between the brain tissue and the rest of the brain to prevent toxins from seeping into the brain. But this barrier is broken down because of this infected white blood cell. And because of that breakdown in barrier, it allows for toxins to pass into the brain and immune uh, markers and inflammatory markers called cytokines uh, seep into the brain tissue, which then breaks down and um, causes uh, strokes and other neurological damage. So, so three main mechanisms by which this virus can damage the brain. 
moving on to the mental health complications as such, uh, we were interested in understanding what we already knew prior to COVID-19 happening. It was quite clear that there was going to be a huge increase in depression and anxiety disorders because of the, uh, the upheaval that this virus was causing on a global scale. But, uh, but this was not the first coronavirus pandemic uh, to hit us. We had SARS uh, and MERS, which were also coronaviruses. And there were lessons to be learned from what we knew back uh, 15 to 18 years ago. And looking at the literature, it was pretty clear that uh, these infections uh, led to an increase in post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, led to an increase in depression, panic uh, and anxiety symptoms, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms. And there was a need for long-term follow-up, but unfortunately, uh, for various reasons, that had not happened. Um, but evidence was there that this, uh, this was likely to be a possibility. And uh, the neuropsychiatry team in London uh, uh, by Rogers and Tony David's team led a, a, a huge uh, systematic review at the time and found that uh, when they analyzed cases of about three and a half thousand patients with coronavirus, not just COVID-19, but previous coronaviruses as well, they found that some of the symptoms were very common, uh, both in the acute illness, but also in, in longer term. So uh, sleep disturbance, anxiety disorders, uh, memory issues, depression, uh, confusion, and so on was very common, but also fatigue and um, uh, traumatic memory sleep disorder was present in a lot of patients, both uh, short and long term. So, so we knew back in May last year that issues similar to long COVID might begin to emerge. There was also an interesting collaborative uh, effort that was set up in the UK called the Coro Nerve Surveillance Study. So this was a collaboration between neurologists, psychiatrists, primary care physicians, and others who opened up a, a sort of portal wherein patients could report the symptoms they were experiencing. And um, because it was so new, people didn't know what to expect at the time, but we were always learning from patients who were reporting symptoms. And um, various uh, uh, symptoms were reported and, and an in-depth analysis of this um, found that people were experiencing lots of strokes, uh, bleeding in the brain, uh, inflammation in the brain, uh, some increase in psychotic disorders, but also various other psychiatric disorders were becoming increasingly manifest. So, so this was a, a very good collaborative effort that, that was initiated at the time and is still continuing and we need more of these. Um, when we look at comparing what is the impact COVID-19 has had on psychiatric disorders uh, in relation to other respiratory infections and, and influenza, for example, uh, Max Tackett, Paul Harrison and colleagues from Oxford uh, have been publishing a lot in this area, analyzing some fairly big data, hundreds of thousands of patients with COVID-19 and um, uh, both, both in the US and, and the UK. And what they found was that the incidence of psychiatric illness, this red line here, was significantly increased compared to influenza. And amongst the psychiatric illnesses, conditions such as anxiety, uh, anxiety disorder, sleep disturbance, and possibly even dementia was, were, were at increased risk. And uh, if uh, if somebody were to have a previous psychiatric diagnosis, their risk of acquiring uh, COVID-19 was also raised. So, so some interesting findings there. And um, this was a paper that was published just two days ago. And I think this is going to be a very important paper in terms of the impact COVID-19 has had on all of our lives. This is uh, by the COVID-19 Mental Health uh, Mental Disorders Collaborative Group uh, uh, with some researchers in Queensland. Um, who've analyzed the impact of COVID on the, on the population. So this is not the direct uh, result of COVID damage, but what is the impact it's had on the population? And as we all know, uh, when you look at the global burden of disease, mental health issues such as depression and anxiety are ranked quite high up in terms of the disability that they contribute. Um, and even prior to COVID-19 occurring, uh, depression and anxiety was quite disabling. But what this shows uh, in terms of an analysis of data from across 200 countries is that um, this sort of salmon uh, pink 
color is the additional cases of depression and anxiety that occurred on top of an already existing burden of depression and, and anxiety in, in the global population. So there was a huge increase in depression and anxiety post COVID-19. Um, and what they found, and perhaps not surprising, is that the link between these symptoms were, were correlated with um, areas where there was high uh, instances of daily COVID infection rates. And it was also correlated with areas which had significant restrictions in mobility or lockdown. So this uh, was direct, directly impacting on people's anxiety and depression. Uh, and also, again, perhaps not so surprising is that women uh, were disproportionately affected with depression and anxiety, and young people were significantly more affected by depression and anxiety. So just to put this in words uh, or numbers, sorry, um, an additional 53 million people were affected by depression and anxiety, and an additional 76 million people were affected by anxiety disorders. So it's a huge impact uh, on the global population. Uh, we were also discussing last year about the impact uh, COVID-19 might have on pregnancy uh, and uh, whether this will affect the newborn or the fetus in the womb. Uh, and we looked at our colleagues, uh, the Flory Institute, to help us with this from their knowledge of uh, animal studies and what we could learn from that. Because the placenta, which nurtures the, the infant, is very rich in ACE2 receptors, and we uh, in, it, we know that that's the, the root of passage of the virus, so it's quite likely that um, the infants could be affected as well. Uh, what uh, we found when we reviewed the literature was that early reports indicated that perhaps this was not happening, but as time evolved, lots and lots of studies have reported that transmission of the virus can indeed occur from the uh, mother who's infected with COVID-19 into the fetus. Uh, and how we know this is uh, there's a particle or an antibody called IgM, a molecule, and this molecule is quite a large molecule, so it cannot actually pass from the mother to the infant because of the placenta, the placenta filters it out, we call it the placental barrier. But infants born to uh, mothers who were affected by COVID-19 were already uh, demonstrating signs of IgM antibodies as soon as they were born. And this indicates that the infant was exposed to maternal uh, immune changes and was producing antibodies. So, so this change was actually occurring in utero or, or before birth. And this has some implication in terms of what's going to happen longer term as these children grow up. Um, and we saw from the earlier paper by Nathan in France that children were uh, showing signs of uh, some neurological uh, damage. So, so our colleagues at the Flory looked at animal models and, and informed uh, us that uh, a concept called maternal immune activation or MIA can occur wherein there's increased stress and increased inflammatory markers in the mother that can occur, which can have an impact on the, on the fetus, but also uh, fetus such as low maternal iron, gestational diabetes, and maternal stress levels can increasingly contribute to, uh, to these sort of difficulties. Uh, and we know from previous influenza outbreaks um, that uh, long-term neurodevelopmental issues can happen. Um, and uh, it is still very much an unknown area for us. We need to, to follow up these kids and find out how things emerge in real time over the next 15, 20 years. But the potential mechanisms that we know so far is that maternal infection can tri trigger these immune responses uh, that may uh, be transmitted to the, to the fetus. And critically ill pregnant women are at risk of hypoxia or, or uh, uh, brain damage because of lack, lack of oxygen. Uh, that can cause some complications both for, for the mother as well as the, uh, as well as the infant. So I'll change tack now and move on to the, the last uh, part of my discussion today, uh, long COVID. Long COVID uh, is known by many different names. Uh, it's uh, in some places it's called as post-acute COVID, post-COVID and so on. But what it refers to is a constellation of symptoms that persist and continue to occur over a period of three to four weeks. Uh, so the acute infection passes, but these symptoms continue to remain much longer beyond that acute period. 
And um, well, it's, a, it's a cluster of symptoms uh, affecting multi-systems. So muscle ache, extreme fatigue. This is fatigue beyond what can be comprehended. Uh, you, you've all probably heard about Australian athletes talking on television about long COVID and, and how it's affecting them physically, but also mentally. And it, it, uh, uh, it of course contributes to a lot of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and cardiac uh, changes and so on. Um, so, so we're beginning to notice a lot of this uh, happening in people who have recovered from the acute infection. One of the first uh, studies that came out in this area was from Chicago, where they, they, they followed up patients who were discharged from hospital, th those who survived COVID and discharged from hospital, and found that more than half these patients had extreme fatigue. Uh, and also uh, more than one third of these patients had memory issues. And these memory issues were, were really making an impact on people's day-to-day -day lives because uh, uh, people couldn't remember where they'd parked their car or what sort of jobs they were doing and so on. And uh, because of that, um, it was affecting their quality of life. And um, in, in the UK, there was a, a large scale study of cognition that was conducted, testing people's ability to, uh, to think, process information, memory, and so on. Um, and what Hampshire and, uh, and their colleagues found was that if the illness was quite severe, it contributed to much uh, more significant cognitive uh, decline. So when you compared people without respiratory symptoms uh, and compared it with the most severely ill people who are in ICU, the, the people in ICU had much uh, more significant cognitive decline compared to the asymptomatic people. And this did not differ if people were hospitalized or not. So if, if people did not need hospitalization and were at home, but still had respiratory symptoms, there was a degree of cognitive decline that was higher than, the, than those without respiratory symptoms. It wasn't statistically significant, but it was you know, trending in that direction. So, so the, the message from, from this study, which correlates with a lot of other research emerging, is that severe, the more severe the illness, the more it can cause cognitive damage. And Tackett and their colleagues uh, have been publishing again in the in the area of long COVID, which uh, we, Chris and I are particularly interested in at the moment. Uh, and what stands out is the is the prevalence of anxiety and depression. It is the commonest feature uh, in our long COVID patients. And second comes abnormal breathing, headache, and fatigue is is right up there. So we need to to be planning for services to to address these issues. Uh, when you look at the evolution of uh, long COVID symptoms, it's uh, sort of a diagram that, that um, builds a network of symptoms as, as it evolves. Depression and anxiety is not common in the first 45 days. So, so at the time during the acute illness, it's abnormal breathing, uh, chest pain, sore throat, uh, and some tiredness. But as it evolves beyond 45 days, uh, anxiety and depression become manifest, and beyond three months and nine uh, and six months, what you tend to see is all the other features of long COVID beginning to emerge. So, uh, fatigue, headaches, um, uh, abdominal symptoms, cognitive decline, and so on. So, so it it's a cluster of symptoms that evolves over time, uh, and, and we need a better understanding of it. However, there is hope. Uh, things are looking up and things are looking better and vaccination is providing uh, that answer to us uh, right now. So this is a study that looked at um, what, what happens to people who develop a COVID-19 infection post-vaccination. So key findings of this was uh, regardless of the age group, uh, vaccination tended to significantly reduce hospitalization. Uh, and people with uh, who are fully vaccinated had much fewer symptoms of COVID-19 and during the long term. Uh, and the symptoms lasted shorter duration and most of them who had it were asymptomatic. So, so that's, uh, that's hopeful. Uh, and also in uh, the, uh, these researchers looked at the cluster of long COVID symptoms. Uh, uh, things like brain fog, low mood, were significantly reduced in those who were vaccinated compared to the un unvaccinated or partially vaccinated uh, population. So, again, begins to demonstrate that long COVID symptoms can be addressed by vaccination. There's other treatments emerging as well, but this might help prevent that occurring in the first place. 
And one of the other key challenges, both uh, in the UK here and elsewhere, has been trying to identify and set up services that can help people with long COVID issues. For a long time, patients were struggling to describe what they were experiencing because they, it, it, people felt that there was no validation of their symptoms, there was no treatment and, uh, and so on. But in, increasingly, it's, it's a well-recognized condition. And um, I think we need to use our collaborative networks to, to help these patients and support them, not to acknowledge, uh, of course, in the first instance, but also help find the right services uh, in terms of rehabilitation. Uh, what could look like a, a potential model for a long COVID service, long COVID clinics that are being established in the world is to look at a, a, a truly multidisciplinary team of uh, specialists being involved. Um, we need setups wherein you can have uh, respiratory physicians and cardiologists and neurologists and psychiatrists and primary care specialists, uh, blood disorder specialists and so on. So who can all come together uh, and work towards uh, help improve the quality of life for, for these patients. And finally, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to close with a few remarks, uh, just, just as take home messages. COVID-19 has had a significant impact uh, on the brain uh, and mental health issues. Uh, the most commonest issues, uh, mental health wise, it causes is depression and anxiety, uh, but it can cause other neurological damage, particularly cognition and thinking that gets affected. Uh, it can affect pregnant women. We need to protect them. Uh, we're not clear about the long-term issues that the children with uh, infection might face. Um, the psychosocial impact of lockdowns and high infection rates is significant, and women uh, and younger age groups are disproportionately uh, affected because of this, and vaccine provides protection. So as we continue to witness the, the devastating uh, impact of the pandemic, we need to utilize our collaborative networks to systematically understand what's happening, document, uh, and find treatments and preventative strategies. Here is, uh, is a significant opportunity for us because this disease has been mapped in unprecedented detail, which should allow for establishment of long-term studies. And sadly, this is unlikely to be the last pandemic or global crisis humanity has faced. We must have uh, concerted international collaborative research efforts and fully resourced organizations such as this um, to support mental health promotion and well-being if we are to gain an advantage in this battle to protect and optimize global health and prosperity. And finally, this is our team that I'd like to thank uh, uh, for their collaborative efforts. Thank you. Mahesh, thank you very much for a comprehensive overview of a very complex uh, topic and one that's affected everybody in so many ways. And clearly this, um, this pandemic is, and this virus is challenging us on all fronts. It affects so many organs and um, what you've demonstrated today is that it's having an impact uh, on the brain and on mental health. Uh, and, in, and that includes the, the potential direct invasion of the brain by the virus. And I think this is something that we need, really need to be thinking about and what the consequences of that uh, are and have been. It affects thinking, cognition, and it causes even more serious side effects such as stroke. Um, the impact on mental health is very striking and I think demonstrating what you demonstrated today is the, the very high levels of anxiety and depression that have resulted because of this virus. And it seems that it's also impacting more. These issues are impacting more on younger people. I think this is a very important issue that we really need to be thinking about and it's gonna impact on and, and be a major challenge for mental health services. It's encouraging to see that the vaccination is having an impact on these issues that you've raised. And I think that's uh, something we all need to bear in mind. Um, the importance of a multidisciplinary team is something you've also emphasized. And I think when we put that paper together, uh, what uh, was um, uh, really important was to bring together experts from all fields because this virus is impacting not only on brain but uh, the respiratory system, on coagulation. Uh, we need uh, 
people um, with, who are experts in what's happening in pregnancy and potential impacts on, on, on infants. And so we're going to require long-term follow-up studies to look at the sequelae of this, uh, of this uh, pandemic indeed. So thank you very much uh, for providing um, this excellent talk today. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get uh, uh, Professor Loict online uh, from Munich, um, presumably because of technical uh, difficulties. So we might have, we've got a few minutes for discussion and I I'll hand over to um, Professor Tong uh, and others to um, make further comment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've started today on purpose uh, with biology, if you like, uh, just to remind people that uh, behind mental health problems, we have a brain uh, which drives our mind and our feelings and emotions. And understanding that to begin with uh, is very important. Uh, I had a question here from somebody in in the audience, <laughs> and it might seem a little from left field, but I don't think so. And that is that chronic fatigue syndrome is an unrecognized, neglected um, condition in our society, which particularly affects women and youth. Uh, and there's a lot of stigma associated with it. And here you are describing another issue uh, with uh, long COVID, which sounds very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, what do we need to do to have these longer term outcomes acknowledged so that the community will be informed of them, not afraid of them, seek help for them and not be stigmatized? Uh, I, I think that's an excellent question, Bruce. Uh, uh, as the, uh, the, the um, person raising the question has commented, it's uh, chronic fatigue has been an underrecognized issue for a number of years, and there is a significant overlap uh, in terms of the symptoms and phenomenology people uh, are experiencing as a result of long COVID as well. Uh, in the UK, there's an organization called NICE, uh, which produces guidelines for a treatment of these uh, conditions um, based on best available evidence. Uh, and recently, there, there was a bit of a controversy. NICE recommended that uh, a lot of resources used for treating long COVID should be uh, exactly, or, or drawn out from chronic fatigue services and uh, ME services and so on, So, which caused a bit of an outrage from uh, uh, survivors and ex uh, uh, consumers of, uh, uh, of chronic fatigue syndrome issues because they felt, and rightly so, that uh, resources minimal that they may be are being diverted away from, uh, from those existing issues. So I think, uh, first of all, we need to acknowledge that this is uh, a poorly understood issue, but the, the sort of damage it causes to the individual disability is considerable. Uh, and people need help from multidisciplinary specialist services to, to come together and, and support uh, physical, but also mental health and well-being issues. So, um, so I think long COVID hopefully will bring this more into, into focus, but, uh, but also resources will be set up to help people, not just with long COVID, but chronic fatigue and other similar issues. Yes, thank you. It's uh, in important, isn't it, to talk about it being multidisciplinary and uh, collaborative. It's interesting that the uh, Mental Health Foundation Australia is currently working on establishing uh, a mental health uh, uh, promotion hub uh, in an area of the city of Melbourne, uh, which we're looking towards. And certainly, I know we'll be talking with you and Chris and others who are thinking very, in a very similar way about the importance of, uh, of collaboration. Uh, there's another issue here too, which has just cropped up. I'll try and uh, put it into question form, um, if I can, looking at the chat. Um, and that's to do with why women and youth. Uh, is, is the um, virus misogynist? Uh, what? What's going on here? Uh, is this particularly persecutory? Uh, or will it, for example, uh, focus more on uh, our Indigenous community? Has it got to do with cultural or economic factors, or is it a biological matter we're looking at? 
Uh, I think this is a complex issue and I can see Jayashree nodding and, and she's probably more qualified as an expert to speak on this than I am. Uh, I'll just outline briefly my thoughts and perhaps invite Jay Jayashree to comment as well. Uh, I think over, over the years there has been uh, a, a dearth of research in terms of gender differences, uh, what, what happens uh, in terms of outcomes, how disease progression matters and so on. We, we saw that early on with this uh, simple issue of mask fitting uh, was very different to men and women. Uh, and most of the masks were tailored for men's, men's facial features and so on. Um, so, so this is a significant issue that needs addressing. Um, what we, what I know, at least from COVID perspective, is the mortality rates are probably slightly higher in men, but the features of long COVID significantly impact women. Uh, and of course, we have to take into context the psychosocial aspects as well. Uh, women are more likely to be working from home, managing uh, children, other responsibilities, homeschooling, and so on. Uh, of course, men are doing that as well, but proportionately, women might be doing more of it and has a significantly more psychosocial impact on them. Uh, I can speak for that from my own family setting and, and um, uh, discussions with my wife as to how it's affected her. Um, so, uh, and there are possibly genetic vulnerabilities uh, in other populations as well, which we still are yet to understand. Uh, from a mental health perspective, those with serious mental illnesses are already at an increased risk of metabolic syndrome and uh, reduced mortality compared to the general population. This disproportionately affects them. But we've seen from the, the paper that came out a couple of days ago that uh, the impact of depression and anxiety is across the world, but disproportionately affects women and younger people. Can I, can I add a little bit more there? Hello, everybody. And uh, what a wonderful talk that uh, we've just heard. Thank you so much. I guess the other side of the biology, um, and again, most of the issues for why women have more COVID problems is uh, psychosocial, but there, the biology in terms of the gender differences in immunology systems are there. And we only have to think about, for example, women have a greater propensity and have to dampen down their uh, immune responses when pregnant. Otherwise they would expel the fetus as a foreign body because it has half the DNA from uh, the, the, the male partner. So, uh, it, you know, using this, there's been considerable work looking at the responsivity or dampening down of the immune system in general. And so while there's the positive impact that's required in pregnancy, that can also create the negative impact that in fact, the system goes into a dampening down aspect at some cases. Of course, you've got also the angiotensin converting enzyme differences and the responses there are worse in men. So you're quite right. That's why the male morbidity, one of the reasons the male morbidity is supposed to be worse. But there are some, this, this, the pandemic has raised an interesting new field to look at the gender differences in immuno responses to particular um, environmental stressors. But nonetheless, I mean, I'm happy, um, I'll be talking more about the reasons for why women are uh, struggling more during this pandemic. Thank, thank you, Jayshree. That will be a very nice uh, segue to you shortly. Uh, what I'll do now is uh, I'll uh, firstly thank uh, Professor Pantelis for convening uh, this session uh, to remind us all that COVID uh, impacts the brain, uh, which of course is behind uh, mental health and well-being as the substrate, as the foundation stone. Uh, thank you, Chris, for convening this. And in particular, uh, Mahesh, uh, thank you for giving an extraordinary broad uh, survey of what we're now learning about uh, COVID uh, impact on the brain and post-COVID, which we must all become mindful of and understand because it has implications for the health service, for education, for the workplace, and for the community in general across the board, globally. Uh, this is a global, a global issue. Uh, thank you very much uh, for presenting this, which uh, was of interest to all. Uh, there was the best of science there. Uh, you also translated it <laughs> into, I think, uh, words that uh, others who don't have a scientific background 
can understand uh, because we've got a very broad uh, a community representative a range of people joining with us today uh, across the age spectrum, uh, cultural spectrum and with all sorts of uh, backgrounds. Um, uh, thank you again for sharing your wisdom. Uh, and Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Bruce. Highlighting this, uh, this conference. I wish you well and uh, thank you for reminding us uh, uh, yet again another reason that we all should be vaccinated. Okay, well now I'm going to move on um, to uh, welcome uh, one of my best friends and colleagues, uh, Jayashree Kulkarni. Professor Kulkarni is the uh, Professor of uh, Psychiatry uh, at Monash and the Alfred Hospital and runs the Alfred Hospital uh, uh, Psychiatry Research uh, Centre. Uh, she's got an enormously distinguished uh, um, record of contribution to research and clinical services, particularly around uh, the issues of women's mental health and women who become seriously mentally ill uh, with, uh, with psychosis. Um, it's not surprising that, for example, she is, uh, has been president of the International Association of Women's Mental Health. Um, uh, today, uh, Jayshree is going to address us on the topic of women social, cultural and political issues such as sexual workplace and domestic violence in the context of the pandemic and post-pandemic environment that impact mental health and resilience. Uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence today, uh, Jayshree, welcome. Thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, again, I am um, delighted to be in such wonderful company and uh, Bruce uh, is my mentor. Uh, he, he was the person who said, Jayshree, if you don't get on and do your PhD, you'll never get anywhere in academia. And I'm always grateful that he gave me so many opportunities and pushed my, my attention to academic matters um, forward when he did. And I've really enjoyed learning and working with Bruce. And it continues. This is Bruce's retirement, would you believe? Um, you know, when he retired from Monash, we thought, can't see him just taking up golf. And certainly he hasn't. He's uh, he's been an absolute elder statesman of psychiatry and, and we love him for it. So thank you, Bruce. I'd like to acknowledge um, the custodial owners of the lands and waters that we are all standing on and also to acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded by the Indigenous peoples and that has the term terra nullis has created incredible hurt and pain for generations to come. So um, I'm going to talk about women's mental health and I'm really um, grateful to Mahesh for such a wonderful talk beforehand. And um, I'm hope to, hoping to expand a bit on some of the things that he actually started um, to discuss. But I'm going to take a different tack. It's not so much the biology, although the biology is very interesting, of course. And I want to talk more about the need for tailored mental health services for women in the era and post era. Um, if we can get there fast, that would be nice. The post era of COVID. So I just go back a bit to talk about the general context of women's mental health. So the spheres of influence, and I do like the biopsychosocial model, it really is a very good explanatory model in mental health because mental ill health is a very complicated uh, condition, a set of conditions. And I think we need to think about the broad aspects of cultural factors, social factors, psychological, bioneurological, and genetic that all play together um, and, and actually create mental ill health and and I always think that in in my practice and my research the best answers come from being able to work in all of these different domains and to borrow the best of the best from the people that are working in say genetics and apply it into mental health um, and look at the impacts of social and cultural effects on genetic material. So broad brushstroke um, we could think about the theories to explain gender differences in mental illness as due to the social theories, that's what's going on in women's lives, the biological theories, what's going on in the body, and the psychological theories or what's going on in personality. And overall, we can understand that 
uh, mental health is impacted by all of these factors and especially recent world events such as COVID has been um, presenting increasing traumatic impact on women's rights politically, equality, politically, safety and freedoms. And therefore the potential for mental illness has increased with in adverse effects on future generations. Because that's another reason for thinking about women's mental health. It's not just sometimes the woman herself, but it's the context. And this is about the woman uh, in terms of mother for the future generations, as well as obviously um, society as a whole. So we know about the, uh, this very uh, commonly depicted molecule that in late 2019, the 2020 COVID uh, virus impacted the world. And a lot of things that had been going on for women in terms of advances, we think of the Me Too movement, we think of the Times Up movement, all both beginning in the US but spreading globally to try to improve the equality or the uh, political status of women worldwide um, really took a backseat because of the pandemic. And um, it, it, it really uh, did come right out of the blue in the midst of a whole range of of other movements. So when we think about biopsychosocial framework for women's mental health and COVID, let's look at the social impacts. So what has happened with COVID for women? Across the globe, women generally earn less, they save less, they hold less secure jobs and are more likely to be casual employees. So that's a pre-COVID situation. And then um, also along with that, is the fact that women often have had less access to social protections and in single parent households, it's often the woman or the mother who is the single parent. So this all means that globally, the, the capacity that women have to absorb economic shocks is much less than women. And this is from the UN policy brief brought out in 2020. Worldwide data has shown that COVID-19 global recession it will result in a prolonged dip in women's incomes and labour force participation. It is being called the pink recession. And in many countries, including Australia, the first round of layoffs was particularly acute in the services sector, such as retail service, hospitality service and the tourism um, service, where, in fact, women are major um, employees and overrepresented. And this has then resulted in an unexpected and a seen rise in the numbers of women living in poverty, both in this country and overseas. And we have to also remember that money is power and hence the gains in power for women in pre-COVID time is now regressing, going backwards, which is increasing female vulnerability because the actual incomes are, are diminishing and that therefore has led to a lesser, um, a lesser uh, uh, power situation. So what is this all getting to? Well, we know that women make up 70% of the health force. And when we think about frontline health workers in this country and elsewhere, we know that also women are on the front line as nurses, midwives and community workers, as well as major facility service staff. So many of the health um, receptionists, clerks, cleaners and catering staff are all more likely to be women, which means they are all much more likely to be exposed to the virus. So as well as the economic issues, we now have this increased uh, exposure to the virus and as Mahesh said, very interesting differences. For example, it took an hour and 15 minutes for when I was fitted for the N95 um, mask. And that was because of having to go through a range of different sizes uh, to fit a female face. And that is just one example. But nonetheless, the, the actual exposure to virus is, is much more for women healthcare workers. So what happens with women in COVID in isolation? So there's a paradox here because quarantining to deal with infection dates back to a long time, you know, the plague in 1377 AD. And the paradox here is that isolation is intended to keep people safe, nominally to keep people safe from the vaccine, uh, from the uh, virus. But that in fact, for some women and children, being isolated at home 
actually makes them unsafe because of threats of violence. There are also negative consequences, including losing jobs and economic vulnerabilities and psychological health issues from isolation, loneliness and uncertainty. But the sexual violence and the frequency and severity of family violence has really increased globally during the pandemic. In Victoria, we noted an increase in Victorian women at risk or actually experiencing family violence. And there was a notable increase in women ex experiencing much more extreme episodes of violence and abuse and requiring emergency interventions involving police. I run a women's mental health clinic at uh, the Monash Alfred Research Centre and uh, I have on my waiting list 240 people, which is just awful in terms of the demand for the service. The rapid increase in this demand has been a really difficult one um, for the state of Victoria. And in particular, I've been personally involved in taking and dealing with a number of cases where uh, women are incredibly at risk and had to, I've had to call in help from um, our Victorian police to extract the woman and her young children often from very violent households. So you can imagine that the downstream effect of this in terms of the mental health aspects is incredible with anxiety, depression, panic attacks, fear and phobias, hypervigilance, alcohol and illicit drug use and suicide. They're all terrible things that impact awfully on women's mental health and arise from this social impact factor of, of violence. We've had fun, uh, funding injections for family violence response services, but um, there are still only limited pathways for mental health services and still limit, limits in the safe accommodation for women. So this is why I think, you know, women's mental health really needs to be recognised as a separate area of concern because these sorts of issues are significant issues that impact adversely on women's mental health. And we're watching this terrible uh, situation unfold as we move forward in the pandemic. There are solutions, of course, and it's not all just about putting the problems forward because that's that's something that uh, doesn't get very far. But you know, some of the solutions are really about integrating the prevention efforts and services to respond to violence against women in COVID nineteen response plans, designate domestic violence shelters as essential services, and increase the resources there. Designate safe spaces for women where they can report abuse without alerting perpetrators. So we're trying to set up things such as in grocery stores or pharmacies where women can go, even in a pandemic, that that's a place, a safe place to actually report abuse. And I've had um, police uh, colleagues talk about the fact that, in fact, that's a time when the person, the woman is actually trying to get groceries that she's able to actually use the phone to contact uh, somebody to be able to get some help. Um, I've conducted some, you know, mental health sessions for women when they've been in uh, situations like in the, in the grocery store or in pharmacies because it's been a capacity to reach her when she's locked in to a household with the perpetrator. She cannot talk. She cannot avail herself of a tele mental health session. Services online, um, more services online are also important, again, for that capacity to reach service in the midst of a, uh, a violent household. And of course, increasing the advocacy and awareness campaigns, including uh, targeting uh, male behaviours as well. And of course, Bruce and other child psychiatrists will, will talk more about the impacts of this on the, um, on the small children in domestically violent households as well. So the psychological impacts, clearly we're seeing um, uh, increase as uh, Mahesh has often has uh, just told us that uh, in fact, when we did our own survey, um, Caroline Gervich is the chief author here. Um, we did a quick survey um, in Victoria and we tried to include, and we did include our rural uh, colleagues. 
And um, what we found here in the survey was that 35% um, of women had moderate to severe levels of depression compared to 19% of males. 27% of females had moderate to severe levels of stress compared to 10% of males, and 21% of females had moderate to severe levels of anxiety compared to 9% of males. So this is one of many surveys, and um, there are global surveys that show exactly the same results that, in fact, by and large, the uh, mental ill health impacts of the pandemic is much worse for women. And we think this is because pre-existing or pre-COVID, women already had a twice as high depression um, uh, experience over the lifetime, a four times as high anxiety experience, and certainly um, have much more greater propensity for diagnosis of this condition called borderline personality disorder, which is a term that I really do not um, use and uh, prefer to think of it as a trauma disorder. OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder and eating disorders also noted to be much higher in women pre-existing or pre-COVID. So already women were starting with a greater um, mental ill health load and then COVID came along and made all of that much worse. We also note that there are special issues for some women um, in, with, um, in their terms of their mental health and that mental health carers are predominantly women. So for example, this is caring for uh, relatives who have both physical and mental ill health conditions. So predominantly women are doing caring um, and um, again, in isolation, that has often meant that there hasn't been a capacity for them to be supported in their caring role and that they have often not had um, the capacity to have respite. The migrant and refugee women, um, again, Harry Minnis and others are experts in this area, but we note that there's been heightened language barriers um, uh, we saw with horror what happened in the housing commission uh, flats and again women uh, who are migrants or refugees uh, who are not able to understand because the uh, language barrier uh, about isolation and um, all, all sorts of aspects really are at a big disadvantage. Cultural support groups, community support groups um, have also gone missing because of the isolation and lockdown. Older women are another very important group where there's an increased mental health and health risk. So older women, um, uh, like older men, we're told, and it's true that in the first wave in particular back last year when we did not have a vaccine, that they were very much at risk of, of not just getting the infection, but dying of the infection as well. And so this has, re has led to an incredible increased anxiety and depression, particularly um, in uh, older women who are isolated from extended family support and with the lack of visits in nursing homes and so on, uh, obviously that has been terrible for mental health. So what is all this in terms of forward movement? I really am putting the case strongly forward that we need specialist women's mental health clinics. I run one. There are very, there's no other publicly mental health funded general women's mental health clinic. There are perinatal clinics, but they are for women who are in their pre um, antenatal, uh, pre-delivery phase of pregnancy or postnatal. Um, in terms of actual eating disorder clinics and so on, then they are there, but they're not set up as specialist women's mental health clinics. And as I said, there's been a rapid rise in the numbers of women needing assistance for new or exacerbated depression and anxiety. In particular, our general practitioner colleagues working in rural and regional Victoria um, have, have really had a considerable workload, particularly with women who are experiencing anxiety, depression, new cases. And um, attention is needed for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because as soon as lockdowns are announced, it's quite dramatic in terms of the numbers of women who suddenly experience a sudden rise in um, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms as they recall what happened to them the last time they were in lockdown. And this is especially true for women who experienced any kind of domestic violence that has not been resolved. 
um, eating disorders has escalated um, in the whole population, but particularly in women who already started with a higher propensity for eating disorders, this has escalated. So I do um, uh, call on people to think about actually uh, advocating for specialist women's mental health clinics um, around uh, Victoria and the country, because it is something that is different there needs to be a focus on the biopsychosocial aspects for women uh, so that there is a better outcome for women's mental health. That does include a better aspect of, un, a better understanding of biological aspects of um, such things as the uh, impact of uh, pregnancy, the impact of menopause, the impact of um, caring, the, the impact of employment uh, in the casual labour force and loss of that employment, of being a single parent and so on and so on, uh, which are all different for women and the experience needs to be recognised as requiring a special focus for women uh, in, in clinics to forward manage this particularly growing area of need. So with that in mind, in September 2021, I opened Australia's first women's mental health hospital. So this is the first women's mental health hospital at Cabrini Health Melbourne. And uh, the tagline is innovating and leading the way in mental health care for women. Um, this grows out of the work that I've done for decades, um, both clinically and research, but again, also accelerated by the need for women's mental health to have for women to have something important that needs that that meets their needs um, as we come into the post COVID era. So this is just a, a the picture from the outside. It's a thirty bed uh, inpatient private health hospital, which Cabrini Health is a private hospital uh, called the Lisa Turin Women's Health Centre after the philanthropist who helped this to get underway. Um, and we designed this particularly with women in mind. So you can see that there's been attention paid to the aesthetics, um, the gardens and the flowers and the colours and so on. Um, quiet areas with fountains, um, using the natural ambience as well. I, that I'm the director of this 30 bed unit and Sharon Sherwood is the nursing head. Uh, some of the staff, again, with a heavy um, emphasis on having um, clinical psychologists, social workers and OTs, so improving the amount of um, psychotherapies and other skill-based therapies that are going on. Physical health is a really important part of this, as well as nutritional health. Um, and again, just to give you an idea of the ambience, um, food is really important, so there are actual um, nutrition um, uh, nutritionists who, who holds um, classes and also uh, there's a special cooking area for women as part of the therapy. I wanted to um, end on, um, and that's a, that's a private um, hospital, we have got also a tender that we've won with the Alfred and Ramsey Health to develop a 35-bed um, hospital for women only and that will take place um, sometime soon we hope it'll be at Albert Road Clinic and also at Shepparton and um, again I'm, I'm delighted that that will mean that for the first time in Victoria first time in Australia we'll have a dedicated 65 beds for women's mental health you might think that's pretty amazingly big number, but it's not when you look at the numbers of women who are requiring help. And I think it's time that we see this as a really important issue, that women's mental health is always everyone's business. It isn't just secret women's business. It's not women's mental health for women only, because basically if we understand the causes of mental ill health in women better, and we tailor treatments and services to improve women's mental health, that does in fact impact on our whole community and also on future generations. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I think uh, Jayshree is now going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Shalini Arunagiri. So it's my very great pleasure um, and privilege to introduce Shalini. So Dr. Shalini Arunagiri 
is a, um, a an addictions psychiatrist. In fact, she heads up the division of the college that is related to addiction psychiatry. Um, Shalini has, has worked with me in the um, Central Clinical School Department. She's also Central, uh, sorry, she's also the Eastern Health Deputy Director working in Turning Point with Professor Dan Lubman. And I'm very proud to announce that Shalini has received an NHMRC um, investigator grant, which is uh, to do further research in women and addictions, and that is her key specialty. So I'm very pleased to hand over now to uh, Dr. Shalini Arunagiri. Thanks, Shalini. Thanks, Jayashree, and thanks everyone for having me here today. Really a pleasure to join you on World Mental Health Day. Um, to be able to discuss a topic that's quite close to my heart, um, my research interests in, in women and addictions. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen so you can join me. I hope you can all see that. So as I was saying, today I'm speaking to you a little bit about women and addiction and a focus really on the impacts of COVID-19 on how women have um, related to mental health and substance use disorders over the course of the last couple of years. Um, just starting off by acknowledging the lands on which we're all meeting. Um, for me, that's Wurundjeri land and acknowledging the people of the Eastern Kulin Nation as the custodians, paying respect to their elders past and present and emerging, and acknowledging that Aboriginal sovereignty was never ceded. I'm moving forward. I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about COVID-19's impacts on women, picking up from where Professor Kulkarni has left off, um, discussing the impacts on mental health in particular, but also the key drivers of, of problematic substance use um, that we know are really established in the literature, understanding how that's had an impact on women in the last couple of years. Now, I've put some um, images here of, of Melbourne in the height of our lockdown. As you've all experienced, um, for the people joining from Victoria, Melbourne holds um, a ubiquitous record of, of having being the city with the longest lockdown internationally. And that's obviously had some impacts on everyone living here in Victoria. But I think in terms of women, we've heard from a number of speakers already this morning about those impacts. And I think they're really clearly articulated in this image here. Um, for many women, this has been reality for the last couple of years. And um, this morning, I'm just going to take you through how this might translate to impacts on, on substance use in particular. Now, we know that there are key drivers of problematic substance use um, in the community across countries. Um, and these key drivers are mental health instability, so a range of different mental health disorders and the use of problematic substances as a means to cope. Um, we also know that economic burden and unemployment has a huge impact on a driver for use of substances. Homelessness is the key driver and family violence is another key driver. Now, all of these impacts have been really intensified during COVID-19 and I'll take you through some data that highlights that. Some people have alluded to, we know that there's been a global impact on, on mental health um, during the course of the pandemic. And this is data, um, as you may have seen, that's just been released in the last couple of days in The Lancet. I'm really highlighting the large and un uneven impact on global mental health. There are particular um, demographics that are more clearly affected. We know that young people are clearly affected. And we know that women across the world have been more affected than men. Um, this is particularly in terms of major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders. And we know that these symptoms are really intensified as the lockdown has progressed. Um, if people are interested in this study, the, the link is there for people to read. But I think just highlighting for women, what we're seeing is in comparison to baseline, there's been a change in the prevalence of anxiety disorders and major depressive disorders. Now we know that these are key drivers of substance use um, outside of the impact of COVID-19. And we know that during COVID-19, these have been intensified through a range of other drivers as well. So economic burden has been substantially um, disproportionately affected women, both in Australia and internationally. And we see that the job losses have been in industries with the greatest impact, as Joshua has mentioned, that women have also been less likely to access income support. So in Australia, that's been JobKeeper, for instance, um, that has disproportionately um, been in industries that have been male focused rather than female focused. We also know that women are overrepresented in part-time and casual work, and they're more likely to then pick up unpaid work and carer duties and reduce their paid work as a result. That's been translated through homeschooling and caring duties. 
So as you can see here, this is an image from the Grattan Institute that highlights those industries where women are overrepresented. And these have been the hardest hit industries during the lockdowns, hospitality, retail, arts and recreation. And we know that these industries have been less likely to be able to access government support, such as JobKeeper. Well, the next impact has been homelessness. And in Australia and in many other countries, older women are the fastest growing group of people experiencing um, homelessness. And that comes as a surprise, I think, to, to many people. Um, the traditional sort of stereotype of people at risk of homelessness, often younger and often male. But we know that this particular demographic is, is significantly at risk from a whole range of different reasons. But women and families during the COVID-19 pandemic have been particularly at risk because of, of family violence as well. That's the leading cause of homelessness for women. And um, lack of stability in housing clearly leads to, to lack of stability in mental health, but also is a key driver for substance use, as we know. In terms of family violence, as we've heard in a couple of speakers already allude to, this has been a significant concern for mental health professionals internationally. Um, we know that there's been a significant increase in intimate partner violence, um, and this is the reported statistics which are likely to be significantly underestimated. Um, there's a range of factors as a result of lockdown that have intensified those risks, particularly isolation and the, the lack of capacity to access supports and help. In Victoria, we know that there have been increased reports of family violence and that the reports from family violence practitioners um, suggest that they've increased not only in frequency, but also in the severity and the complexity. This is alongside the fact that a lot of existing services have gone online um, and there's a um, relative lack of services on the ground to be able to support women um, at this really critical period. In terms of alcohol and coming back to kind of the risk factors for, for addiction specifically, um, there's a really established literature that points out that alcohol availability also predicts family violence. And keeping in mind when we think about the COVID-19 impacts that alcohol um, availability has been essentially maintained and in some cases increased during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've had the, a real rise in, in alcohol delivery sales during the pandemic. And so delivery services are actually delivering alcohol to people's homes. And just bringing people's attention to a couple of studies um, that have really highlighted that the density of alcohol outlets clearly predicts um, family violence in different regions. So for instance, if you live in a suburb that has a high density of alcohol outlets, and that's not just on-premise outlets such as pubs, but also um, things like Dan Murphy's, for instance, so um, places that have off-premises and packaged alcohol, that there's an increase in this directly predicting an increase in intimate pers um, personal violence in that area. So thinking about how that impacts on, on women in particular, we know that COVID-19 has had an impact on women's drinking and that women um, relative to men are more likely to have reported an increase in drinking during the pandemic. Um, this is an article that we published in the conversation early on in the pandemic last year that highlighted a range of these factors that I've just talked about and also highlighted that um, mental health, the early data as, as Joshua's presented, was really suggesting that women's mental health was, was being affected. Now, later on in the pandemic, this is what we've, we've identified, that, that um, there are fewer suicides have been reported and there's a lot of concern earlier on in the pandemic about suicide rates going up. Currently, the data seems to suggest that there are fewer suicides, but that alcohol-related deaths have risen substantially. And so this is an 8% increase in comparison to 2019, or a total of 103 additional deaths. Um, this is also in the context of an increase in ambulance-related call-outs um, during the pandemic. And we've also found that the longer that we progress during those lockdowns, and this is particularly a Victorian picture that we're seeing, um, that the alcohol-related ambulance attendance has increased. So um, what we're seeing is essentially people who are starting to use alcohol as a coping mechanism, but that has really increased over the course of the pandemic and people who at baseline already had alcohol related problems, that those problems have intensified as the pandemic's progress. So if we think about women in alcohol use, we've also seen internationally, this is a study that compared UK and Australian um, uh, stockpiling practices, so alcohol purchasing practices. And in women found that women who developed depression over time, so relative to baseline, the people became more depressed over time, that this was an independent and significant predictor of, of stockpiling and alcohol use. So again, this is, is a really important factor. And if we think about caregiving and parenting specifically, that caregiver load 
was a significant issue. So women were more than three times more likely than men to report looking after children full time during the pandemic. And that this in itself, having a child caring role is a statistically significant and strong predictor of increased alcohol use in women. This is a qualitative study that was recently released and, and had some really interesting quotes in there that I think many people can probably um, identify with or are familiar with. That people who are at home the whole day, by the end of the day, that actually using alcohol as a means of release as a, as a coping strategy was actually becoming more and more prevalent and was also becoming more and more normalized so that um, other women were also reporting in. And this was, you know, in other terms, also a form of social support was a form of actually supporting uh, women supporting each other. But on the other hand, was normalizing a coping mechanism that was actually really harmful for both mental and, and physical health. We know that this is also not happening in a vacuum. We know that the alcohol industry plays a big role in, the, in this field. And a report by FAIR that was released last year um, did a snapshot report of an hour on a Friday night, looked at the range of different sponsored ads that were displayed on, on Facebook and social media, and identified that there was an ad pretty much every 35 seconds. Um, that the marketing messages that were coming out from the alcohol industry were really about being able to purchase alcohol without leaving home, um, that, that alcohol would help people survive or help their mental health feel better. And also that nearly three quarters of these ads explicitly mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. We also know that there's a normalization of alcohol use as a coping strategy for parents in particular. And other studies have highlighted the rise of, for instance, on social media, hashtags such as wine, mum and mum juice. Again, normalizing the fact that alcohol use could be used as a coping strategy. So the question is whether these, these coping mechanisms will reverse post pandemic to, to normal coping mechanisms, for instance, there's concern that this could rise in an emerging public health risk. Um, the Alcohol and Drug Foundation launched a campaign last year called Little Habits that specifically targeted this, that highlighting that new behaviors could become part of women's new normal and that some people might have persistent patterns of raised consumption going forward. That's a really significant concern for a lot of health professionals in this area and really highlights the need to kind of increase kind of public knowledge and, and decrease risks associated with help seeking as well. So drawing that to close, what, what we are really kind of invested in is identifying ways to support women, looking at economic and social supports that take a gendered lens and prioritize women's mental health. As Joshua has alluded to, looking at women's mental health specific services. And when it comes to substance use, acknowledging that substance use is the most stigmatized health condition internationally, that on average it takes people up to 20 years to seek help. So when they do, it's really important that people have services that they can access. Um, and also we know that addiction affects one in five families. And so we're really invested in encouraging individuals to talk about addiction, addiction. We've done this through um, documentaries such as Addicted Australia on FBS. And we're also launched a, a national campaign called Rethink Addiction that specifically aims to combat stigma and encourage people to come forward and, and get help. So really encourage people to have a look at that website. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions or my contact details are back here. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Shalini. Uh, again, uh, another presentation which uh, confronts us with uh, a number of very important issues uh, which we can't run away from and as a society we need to know about. You've contributed to uh, that education and given that uh, uh, today's summit is uh, recorded, uh, it will be available for others to look at at their leisure down the track and I think it will probably become a very important podcast, if you like, uh, that will inform the community uh, we're very grateful for your uh, knowledge, uh, your wisdom, uh, your compassion and uh, humanity in this area. Um, we're going now to uh, move to uh, our morning tea break, um, where we will uh, have a good cup of tea, uh, uh, perhaps uh, some soft drink, um, definitely drink some water uh, and think about uh, what... Uh, uh, we've been hearing this morning. Uh, come back, please, uh, at 11.15 a.m. on the dot. Um, that's uh, Eastern Summertime, 
a.m. on the dot when we will resume uh, with uh, the topic of women, uh, perinatal, social, cultural and political issues. Um, good morning and thank you for being with us uh, to this point. Enjoy your morning tea.
Hi, Bruce, are you still there? Hello. Oh, hi. Hi, it's Louise Newman here. Hi, Louise. I oh, know I was just think. wondering, it's Helen Milroy, Louise. I was just trying to <laughs> Bruce to see if I could uh, have a go at screen share. I've done a couple of these things where my screen won't share. Well, exactly. And uh, I got a message about the timings all being changed because of internet outage. Is that happening or not? I don't know. They're on a break at the moment. Are they? Okay. I was just uh, watching. Hi, Professor uh, Milroy and Professor Newman. Hi. Yeah, hi. I can stop sharing if you'd like to try your screen. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks. Sure. Louise, do you want to go first since you're next? Um, yes, I'll just. Am I next? Am I? Okay. Um... Sorry, it's not sharing for some reason. Can you see this share screen button down the bottom? Yep. So I press that, it just comes up with your screen with your name on it, um, which is the one we've been just been looking at. Uh. Would you like to send me your slides? And I can share them from my side if you'd like. Okay. All right, I'll do that. Maybe do check Helen's. Um, yeah, that's why I was asking Carol if you wanted them beforehand. Sometimes it does this, I don't know why. So Anika, shall I try mine? Yes, you can, Professor Mulroy. Okay, I'll just just call me Helen. Um, I'll just Sorry. share screen. There we go. I think mine's working. Yes, I can see that. You can see that? Okay, and then I'll just put it on slideshow when I'm ready. Yep, that's right. Okay, great. So I'll just stop share. Sure, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Nika. Hi, it's Matt Sanders here. Do you mind if I um, try my screen share too? <laughs> we were all anxious. No, we were all anxious. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, with most of the other ones I've done, they've sort of made you book in for a text session, you know. Mm. <laughs> Is that screen sharing? Yep. Yes, that's perfect. That's good. Thank you. All right, well, I'm going to go and get a cup of tea, so I'll be back. Sure, thank you. All right, now I'll see if I can get to my screen.
Hello. Is the new one, is that working for you? Yes, it is. That's great. Thank you. No problem. You can just tell me next slide. We'll change it. Okay. Thanks very much. No Good worries. Morning, Bruce here. Welcome. Oh, hi, Bruce. So, Sorry, we're just having technical problems. It's going so well uh, to date, and uh, we look forward to your contribution. No, thank you. It's a pleasure. So I've been stuck with my... In, we've got this um, COVID ward here at the moment for people with mental illness. So once I go in, I can't get out. There's a PPE yeah. requirements. Otherwise, I would have come. Well, it's pretty tough at the moment. Anyway, so this is good. I'm well, glad it's going well. Carol Crean's going to introduce you. and Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, which is great. And um, Excuse I, me, Bruce. Uh, uh, thanks. Yes. Sorry. Matt, I was just um, wondering whether I might try to do my screen share again. I just want to make sure I've got an audio clip I want to play. I just want to make sure it plays. All right. Well, certainly, um, if if one of the staff, uh, Professor Sanders, wants to do an audio clip, if you could uh, uh, take over. Um, yep, that should okay. be fine. Okay. I just uh, I see what's required now. I just have to uh, share sound and optimize video clip. So yes, I'll just uh, make sure that. Hi, um, I would love to. Can you hear that? Hmm. I'm um, worried about this. Hi, um, I would love to. I am a mother of a ten and a four. I am a mother of a. Ten. Does that play? I can hear it, Matt. Mind. Okay. Um, my name is Atu. And okay, good. That's Thank great. you. So we're starting at quarter past. Is that right? Yes. We are okay. I'm going to get a cup of cup of coffee. In that case, yeah. Hello, Louise. It's Matt here. I don't yes, think hello, we've ever Matt. Met. Not nice to see you. We cross paths periodically. Yes. Yeah, we have. No, you're keeping well in the middle of all yeah. of this. Of course, well, in your place, it's a bit better. Yeah. Well, as we can be expected to, I suppose. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was just saying to Bruce, I've been doing. You know, we have a, a mental health facility where I'm working at the moment for right. people with you know severe issues who can't tolerate other forms of quarantine. So this yep. is a private psychiatric clinic. So it's really difficult work managing people. Oh, I bet. Oh, of course, I bet. you can't understand really what's going on or the necessity of it. And, oh. and then having to talk to clinicians in full PPE with visors on, it's really hard. So it's, it's not the same, is it? No, it's not quite what we're trying to do anyway. 